invite you to turn with your Bibles with me to Romans chapter 10, passage we read earlier. As you're turning, we're continuing in this series of messages uh, about engaging our culture while wearing the full armor of God and employing the fruit of the Spirit. How all of these things wrap themselves around each other. We're, uh, we're working through uh, the breastplate of righteousness, which is that second piece of the armor that's listed there. And then uh, we want to see this morning how it relates to, to goodness. Now, i um, got a question for you. I'm finding that these questions have been uh, quite helpful in getting, getting started. So what is the peril of good enough? You ever uh, done something you thought was good enough? Or, you know, the good, <laughs> Christian's having fun with this one, <laughs> I, can, I can tell. Um, yeah, or maybe, maybe you've had, I, I know we've talked about it, you've had some students who thought they presented something to you that was good enough, <laughs> and it was not good enough. So, yeah, uh, yeah, the, the peril of good enough, that'll do. And you know what? Sometimes you go back and you have to redo it. And, 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 and do it again, and, and maybe, maybe even a third time, or maybe you don't get the opportunity to do it again because it just wasn't good enough. That, that's one of the perils of good enough. How about another one? I, I, I'm a good person. I'm good enough that God should let me into his heaven. I'm good enough. I, I haven't killed nobody. Uh, yeah, you did. Uh, when Jesus died on the cross, it was because of your sin and my sin and the sin of the world. Yeah, yeah. The, the peril of good enough. See, sometimes when things aren't really good enough, <laughs> they really, really aren't good enough, and we have to fix it or we just settle for less than best. And then the whole other side of the spectrum is, is this. Yeah, I'm good enough. What's wrong with me? And what happens then is that, again, your standard becomes the standard, just like in the, the good enough paper that was turned into Christian uh, for, for grading. Yeah. Um, yeah. Who sets the standard anyway? God does. And that's where we bring in this idea of goodness with righteousness today. So let's dig into Romans chapter 1, understanding the peril of good enough. Well, in verses 1 through 4, we see the word righteousness come in right away. Now, we see it come in a, a few times already. Paul, writing to Christian believers there in Rome, he is looking back on his concern for his own people. Remember, Paul was a Jew. He was a teacher of the teacher of the Jews. He grew up in... Uh, the role of learning all that he could, as long as he could, as much as he could, um, about the law. It's recorded for us in the book of Acts that Paul, he, uh, he had great pleasure in persecuting Christians. He was that zealous for the law. Paul, uh, when he came to know Jesus, his heart changed. His desire for the Israelites is that they may be saved. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God. Paul can because he was one of them, just like, just like we said. Being zealous for God. Good enough is not good enough. You got to be good according to dot, 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 dot. You got to have your checklist. I can testify because I was one of them. But their zeal, look at this, is not based on knowledge. Huh. You think that the more you know, especially with the teachers of the law, the Jews, that they would be able to be zealous for God because they knew the law? They didn't really know the law, did they? They had uh, a head knowledge of the law. They could tick off all of the points of the law, maybe, but what was it? 
that got them in trouble. Just like the video. It was their interpretation of the law that got them in trouble. Why else would Jesus go into the temple when he arrived in Jerusalem and overturn the tables of the money changers and those who were selling items used in sacrifice? Oh. Hmm. What is the righteousness of God? Well, let's go on. It, it's not just what you know. Ah, oh, here we go, verse 3. Since they did not know the righteousness that comes from God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Oh, so what is God's righteousness then? God's righteousness is contained in the law. We have five books at the very beginning of the Bible that are called the law, the Torah, and they took great pride in knowing and being zealous about the law. But, hmm, remember Abraham? What's the righteousness that came from God? Even back in the book of Genesis, Abraham, what? He believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Hmm. Even before Moses. Even before Moses was called by God and given the, given the first round of the Ten Commandments, and he went down and saw all the people being naughty, and he busted them up, and God gave them to him again. This was many, 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 many years before Abraham. I mean, before uh, Moses. Hmm. The righteousness of God, when we submit to it, is what? It's believing God, taking him at his word, living by faith. Hmm. Seeking to establish their own righteousness. Oh, we, we got to park on that for just a second, too. So if we don't submit to God's righteousness, then we've already established our own, haven't we? We've already figured out that, yes, I am good enough. Uh, hey, it, it's, it's th this book, how do we really know it's God's word? Well, you got to take it by faith. Righteousness does come by faith. Hmm. So what do we do about this? Well, we'll establish our own righteousness. Whatever I think, if it's true for me, it's going to be true for me, and that's okay. You can have what's true for you, but then what happens when two truths come butting heads? you got a problem. That's why establishing our own righteousness does not work. We have to submit to God's righteousness. How did God express his righteousness? Look at verse 4. When we look at verse 4, we see that Paul writes, Christ is the end of the law, or another translation says, the culmination of the law, so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Wow. What is the righteousness of God? Well, we've established that for Abraham, his faith, and God credited him with righteousness, so it is with us. Christ is the end of the law for everyone who believes. So how is there righteousness for everyone who believes? We'll get into that in, in just a little bit. But Christ fulfilled the law. There's only one person that could not disobey the law. And that was Jesus. Only Jesus. He came, he was sinless, and so he is the one who is the end of the law. The end of the law, you know, the law didn't come to an end. The law is still there. God's word is still true. God's law is still right. That's why I like the, the translation culmination, because it means to bring something to a completion. Not the law ended, but a fulfillment of the law, the culmination. Nobody else, only Jesus, could bring the law to the culmination. There may be righteousness for everyone who believes. So it's not just the Jews. It's just not the Baptists. It's not just the Presbyterians. It's not just fill in whatever denominational group you want to put in. No, it. in fact, it doesn't say anything about denominations, does it? 
everyone who believes. Simply that. If we believe what Jesus did, if we believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and we'll get into more of it in just a little bit, the bottom line is this. The righteousness of God we see in Jesus in believing what God says about his son Jesus. Moving on. What about righteousness? When it comes to law versus faith. Hmm. That's what Paul begins to uh, talk about here in verses 5 through the first part of verse 8. Moses describes in this way the righteousness that is by the law. The man who does these things will live by them. Okay. In other words, the walk equals the talk, right? So for how many folks does the walk 100% of the time equal the talk? No, none, none of us can do that. Nobody. Nobody can do that. We all mess up. The man who does these things will live by them. In fact, that's a quotation right out of Leviticus 18, verse 5. <laughs> yeah. So, hmm. So we have the law. That has to do with uh, works, doesn't it? Hmm. But, hmm, glad that's there. Verse 6, but the righteousness that is by faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the deep, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. Isn't that an interesting way of putting that argument out there? Okay, so we, we get the one who, who lives by the law. Yeah, okay, you got you to gotta live by the law and you got to do the law, all right? Righteousness by faith doesn't say who will ascend into heaven. Oh, okay, now, now we get it. Okay, see, see how this works? If we're living by faith, we don't say, well, who's going to go up and get Jesus to bring him back? I wish they'd do it soon. No, we believe that Jesus is coming again. We, we know that. We believe that. We trust that. But those whose righteousness is by something other than faith says, well, <laughs> come on, ascending into heaven, right. In order to bring... Jesus back. Or who will descend into the deep or into the abyss, into, into Sheol or that, that holding tank? No, we believe that Jesus is at the right hand of God the Father, and he's waiting for God's time to come back. And those who don't have righteousness by faith say, Jesus is just hanging out with, with all of our buddies down in the holding tank until if anything's going to happen, it's going it's to happen. There, there is no faith. There is no faith in what is yet to come. And so the righteousness that is by faith says what? No, Paul says then, but what does it say? Verse 8, the word is near you. It is in your heart and is it in your mouth. It's in Deuteronomy chapter 30. See, the word is near you. It's not, it's not hard to get to. It's not hard to find. Uh, then, even then, it wasn't hard to find. Why? Because those who have the righteousness that comes by faith has it what? In their mouths and in their heart. Now, really, because that was from, Levitica, uh, from Deuteronomy, what did that really mean? I mean, we all couldn't carry our gigantor print Bible around. No, see, that was the way they were taught back then. Remember Deuteronomy 6? Hey, dads, moms too, teach your children. Have them bind the law around their forehead, you know, put it around their neck, mm -hmm. wear it. Wherever you are, as you go along the way, as you sit at home, teach. And even the, the little Hebrew boys, I've, I've said this before, uh, the little Hebrew boys, they, they all went to school. They went to Hebrew school, more or less. And they had to memorize. Those who were set apart, and you know, the, 
like, like Samuel, for example. They had to memorize the Torah. And if they made that cut, then they had to go on and, and memorize the, the history books. And then they went on and memorized the prophets. And then they went on and memorized the wisdom literature in the rabbinic school of teaching. Hmm. But when we find righteousness in the law, we only find it by works. And guess what? Works don't work. But when we find righteousness by faith, the word with a capital W is in your mouth and it's in your heart. Now, in our Wednesday night guys time, we've been challenged to memorize some scripture. Hmm. That's tough when we get into these later decades of life, isn't it? Yeah. And maybe tough when even we're in our earlier decades of life. That's tough. But you know what? The word, if it's in your mouth and in your heart, it can be both places at the same time. So take that to heart, no pun intended. What's next? So then Paul asks the question, who can be saved? Remember, we're talking about righteousness. We're talking about goodness and righteousness. Are any of us then good enough to be saved, here's how. Continuing on in verse 8. That word of faith we are proclaiming. You see, who then can be saved? We can be saved by the word of faith that Paul and the apostles are proclaiming. What is it? It's that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. What is it about faith? This is what you place your faith in. You place your faith in the fact that God raised Jesus from the dead. The soldiers didn't run away because they were able to fend off those weakling disciples who came along to push the stone away and steal Jesus' body. That didn't happen. No, there was an earthquake, and an angel rolled that stone away. So that, what? So that Jesus could walk out? I, I think Jesus, who that same Jesus who passed through locked doors, he could have just gone out. But why? Why was the stone rolled away? Stones rolled away so that the disciples could follow Mary and see that she wasn't delirious that Jesus indeed had risen from the dead and the grave clothes were undisturbed. If you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you see verse 10, the first part says, for it's with your heart that you believe and are justified. Justified, oh, justice, justification. That's a huge thing today because you know, Eternal life matters, E-L-M, right? No, no that, that's not today. Today it's B-L-M, right? But really, eternal life matters. Eternal life is what matters. And to have eternal life, when you are justified by faith, believing it in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, then you're just. Justice has been served. Jesus made it possible that justice would be served on your behalf. You believe that in your heart? You can be saved. And if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Hmm. Lord, boss. You ever hear your kids say, you're not the boss of me. <laughs> yeah. We might as well be saying to God, you're not the boss of me. <laughs> no, I mean, Jesus is the boss of us. Shoot, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you can use that on your kids too. You know, turn that into a teachable moment, right? <laughs> there you go. Uh, confess it with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. And then going on back into the middle of verse 10, 
It's with your mouth that you confess and are saved. So the two go together. What's in your heart comes out of your, excuse me, comes out of your mouth. What's in your heart comes out of your mouth. You believe in your heart, God raised Jesus from the dead. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord, you'll be saved. Hmm. This is how it works. How? Here we go. Confess or profess and believe. As the scripture says, here's another quote. This is from Isaiah, though, this time. Anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. Yeah, yeah, all. You see, the Gentiles, because they had been shunned by the Jews for centuries, we're, we're not good enough. We're, we're not those holy chosen people of God. Certainly they've got to. They're more esteemed by God than we are. No. We are only good enough when we meet God's requirements. He is the one who justifies us. He is the one who makes us righteous. He is the one in whom we place our faith and have it credited to us as righteousness. We're only good enough when God says we're good enough. And when God says we're good enough, it's because he's understood that we believe in our heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and we've confessed with our mouth that Jesus is Lord. That's how we are good enough. Who can be saved then? Verse 13. For everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. It's that simple. It's not our goodness that saves us. We can only be good enough in Christ. So if we're trying to check off all of these things, that, okay, I, huh, I, think, I think I'm all right. I had my quiet time today. In fact, I doubled my quiet time today. Maybe I'll get some extra stars in heaven. No, it doesn't work that way. You're only good enough if you've been justified by grace through faith. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's the peril of good enough. The blessing of goodness and righteousness is that both of these things find their source in the Lord God Almighty because he is good. He is good. And because he is good, we are can be good enough. He was good enough to send the very best to take our place on the cross. That's why we come and celebrate the Lord's Supper this morning. We remember that we're only good enough because Jesus bore our sin in his body. Jesus shed his blood that we might be that the penalty for our sin might be paid for. Let's reflect on goodness and righteousness. And remember that it's only by what Jesus has done for us that we can go and tell people that they don't have to be good enough in their own eyes. It's much easier to be good enough in God's eyes. Father, thank you. Thank you for this time when we can consider all you've done for us. Father, thank you that Jesus bore our sin. Thank you that he died on the cross, that we might be saved. Lord, thank you that our righteousness is not any righteousness of our own, but righteousness is credited to us when we believe you. Father, help our unbelief that we might be pleasing to you in all that we say and all that we do. Now, Lord, watch over us as we partake of, of this communion. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Ask